just to say we, we know it's July 4th and we know that the, the word that gets around in these circles is it's Interdependence Day, as you, as you might know. And so tonight's talk is on... <laughs> It is on the freedom that's possible when we realize our belonging to what's larger than our habitual notion of self. And that is a continued exploration from our last class. And I, I, I'm looking around and I, I think there's some of you that might have been uh, around when there were answering machines, right? <laughs> So one of my friends had an answering machine and you'd call and it would say, what I want to know is, who are you? And what do you want, (laughs) you know? And I got in the habit of when he wasn't there and I got that message of saying, okay, this is the universe telling me to just, you know, actually ponder those questions, you know, who am I? What do I want? They're deep questions. I mean, we might get caught in some moments with the who am I and, and immediately go into a, a narrative of roles or, or the qualities that we don't like or habits, fears, wants. And we might ask that question and go to a very deep place of who am I? I don't know, it's a mystery. But there's something very... Uh, sacred and universal that's living through this body-mind. We, you know, there's a whole, and there's degrees in between. What do I want? You know, we might have some prepackaged formula of our life aspiration. Our, we might really stop and check in and sense what matters. So what I find is that depending on how much stress and reactivity is going on, um, there's very different levels of our response to those deep inquiries. And a week like many of us have had, and if you're listening and you're anywhere in the region of, you know, East Coast, Washington area, uh, D.C., uh, and and actually a a good chunk of the country, um, many lives got turned upside down. You know, many people uh, in this hot streak without air conditioning and so on. And it was interesting for me to use my experience as a kind of a filter for these questions because as I've shared often, whenever I'm giving a talk on something, whatever's going on in my life, that becomes what I'm, you know, I'm kind of using as a filter. So this inquiry of, you know, what does it really mean to be free? And who am I taking myself to be? So my experience during uh, the storm that Friday night was that uh, at its peak, a very, very large oak tree fell down on my house. And I was about 20 feet from where it fell. And so my world got really rattled and it destroyed uh, a lot of three rooms in my house. So it was a pretty big deal. And, um, And of course, there's been no power. I live in a place that's Uh, very treesy, which means the good news is it's beautiful. (laughs) And the difficult news is that those trees, you know, collapse pretty regularly. And so this one did in a a, a bit of my house and um, we, I have a generator, but the generator was kind of flaky. And so it's been an interesting handful of days. And what I noticed was that at times my sense of who am I was beleaguered and anxious and kind of driven and a little bit um, testy with like the generator guy who, you know, had to come back a bunch of times because he didn't get it, the generator wasn't working or... And so I was in a kind of small-minded place at times. And then at other times, uh, it just didn't feel so personal. You know, it wasn't like my house, a tree fell on my house. Like, this is just what's happening, and it's hot, and this, and this, and there was kind of curiosity and space, and a kind of tenderness that, okay, so this human life is caught in some of the really same stuff of so many people, and then actually a real, um, real sorrow for how, for many people, it's so, so bad. Um, I think of the wildfires and really this the predicament of our Southwest. 
really, really difficult. And then I think of other disasters and other people whose lives are entirely dismantled because they live in a war zone, let's say in Syria right now, or there's a famine or drought. Or I think of the animals that are living in the places where there's wildfires. You know, there's so much. So it became less personal. And I kind of found myself going in and out of, of both. And if I had to say, what made the difference between a degree of freedom, not, not detachment like I was unattached, a dissociation, but a freedom that could hold it. And when I was caught, the difference was either I was in a story and believing my story, or there was a quality of presence. Okay, there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And with that presence, there was some room. Does that make sense? I was getting caught in the storyline. So tonight what we'll be doing is a, a, a handful of reflections together on what can help us to loosen up that stickiness of the storyline and help us to come back into a sense of more the truth of what we are. And so we'll do, we'll do some re reflections on, you know, how do we get caught in that kind of limiting self-sense? And how do we relax out of it? Because you can't fight your way out of it or you just kind of create another persona of a self that's fighting, you know? So I like always beginning with, you know, the Buddha taught, you know, he started with suffering, he said, there's suffering and here's how come and here's the way out. And I tend to like to start with the trance. Because in Buddhist psychology, often our habitual daily way of moving through life is this perception that we have, that there's a self in here and a world out there, and there's problems to solve and there's things to do, and this self is threatened or encumbered or this self needs to promote itself, but there's a whole world of a story and emotions that go around the kind of themes of something's wrong or something's missing. So that's the trance. And it doesn't mean that there's not pain. And it doesn't mean that there's not things to do. But what it means is our story about ourself, that it's me and it's happening to me and it's bad or I'm bad, separates us from a larger truth. There's a forgetting that goes on. This is what the Buddha meant by living in a dream. That we live in this story of a small self that is threatened or missing something. So, what we find out is that if we're suffering and we start looking at the suffering, we'll find out that there's a storyline going on. It's either I'm bad or you're bad, but there's a storyline going on about what's wrong. And if we take the broad view, we know that's part of the evolutionary design, right? And we're designed, our brains are designed to kind of fixate on where the problem is. Of course, we overdo it, but that's the way we're, we're kind of meant to be in certain ways. And the metaphor I like the best usually is ocean and waves and that we take ourselves to be a constellation of waves and that constellation compares itself to other waves and it wants to have the surfers like it the best and that constellation feels threatened by waves or it wants to expand itself and be part of a larger group, whatever it is. But we forget our oceanness. We forget that these are temporary shapes that are coming and going. But there's something timeless and beautiful, something sacred that's living through these body minds. We forget that. So, the pathway is really, can we remember oceanness? And one of the um, maybe little practices, and we'll try right now, that I think is real helpful is I'm going to invite you just to kind of come, get ready to pay attention. Okay, you're all ready to pay attention. I love the way we all sit up a little taller to pay, <laughs> compose ourselves. Now for the next 10 seconds, I'd like you to try not to be aware, okay? Close your eyes and try not to be aware for 10 seconds. (sighs) 
Okay, that's enough. Come on back. Now, did anyone succeed? Can I see hands? So a few people succeeded in not being aware. Most of us found what? That you say, okay, I'm not going to be aware, and then there's this whole world of stuff happening, and you can sense that you're aware of it, right? Right? Is that what happened? Okay, let's try this again, okay? Close your eyes again. And this time, let awareness be as it is, this kind of sea of wakefulness. Just take a few moments to notice awareness is here. Just notice what it's like. What's it like to even notice awareness? Okay, that's enough. Now just take a few breaths and come back. Because it's a little bit tricky or strange sometimes. What we discover is that as we move through the day, if we really stopped and paid attention, we'd find awareness is always here. It's always already here. But we rarely notice it. We rarely are aware of awareness. Think of your day. How many moments is there some pausing and a sense of, oh yeah, this wakeful presence is here. It's here. We don't notice. Now noticing it actually is part of the training, but I'm not going to go there yet. First I'm going to talk a little bit about how come we don't notice. One, uh, one cartoon had this, these bugs in a carpet of fur and one saying to the other, is there really a dog, you know? <laughs> Do you get it? That sense that, you know, just so locked inside a perspective that we don't sense what we're part of? Chogyam Trungpa did it this way. He had, he put out a big white piece of poster paper and he did a little V. Okay, and he asked everybody to weigh in. He said, so what is this? And what did they say? Well, a bird. And he asked others. Everybody came up with the same thing, basically. They might have said a seagull, but it was a bird. And he said, no, it's the sky with a bird flying through it. Now this speaks to how we pay attention. Our minds, especially when we're in fight-flight, narrow and fixate. They fixate on objects. They fixate on thoughts. They primarily fixate on a movie going on about, called Self, with the protagonist, and what's wrong, and what might go wrong, or what's helpful, or might be helpful. You know, we're, always, we're all living in our own home movie about self, aren't we? It's like every one of us. We're sitting here, here's not a huge group, but maybe 150. We all have these movies going on through most of the day about that it's got the starring self, right? Narrow. So what's this V? Well, it, it's a sky. There's, there's awareness with these thoughts and feelings moving through it. And if we keep fixating on the storyline, we can't remember that openness, that luminous awareness. We can't perceive it. So the freedom that we describe, and I, I, I like the doing it in two parts, there's freedom from and freedom to. The freedom is from a limiting sense of self. We are in some way on this path to wake up out of an idea of self that is deficient in some way, or um, too needy, or superior, whatever it is, a narrow sense of self. And freedom to? Freedom to live from our wholeness. You wouldn't be here if you didn't intuit in some way a beingness or something vaster and more loving and more creative than you might regularly have access to. 
you wouldn't be listening if there wasn't something that was drawn to a practice and a path that could bring you home to really the fullness of who you are. That's what draws us, the freedom to be who we are. In the Zen tradition, the way to enter that freedom is sometimes described, and I love this term, as the backward step. And here's why. Typically, it's like we're watching a movie, we're fixated on the screen, usually the storyline of ourself, but it could be fixated on pain in particular, or fixated on a particular judgment, or whatever it is, but we're watching a movie. And we're forgetting that the movie is just an emanation coming out of this, this camera of lights, a play of light, you know, different forms, and that it was actually created out of the mind of the person who created the movie, which is really, it all comes out of mind. So instead of watching the movie, the backward step is we kind of turn the attention backwards and sense that awareness is there, and then just relax back into it and be the awareness. The backward step is not a doing. The understanding or wisdom is that we're coming home to what we already are. That this uh, awakeness, this tenderness, this intelligence, this vast space of being is what we are. And rather than doing something, we're kind of undoing and relaxing back. Now, if as you're listening it sounds confusing, if, if I talk about awareness and you, you know, it's, and, and relaxing back into awareness, it just doesn't, it sounds like a, a far cry from how your day-to-day life might be going. I'd like to suggest an attitude as we continue this kind of inquiry tonight. And that is of just curiosity, of knowing you can put down what doesn't seem to fit, and mostly of trusting that if you relax with the inquiry and relax with the exploration, in that relaxing space opens up for truth to come through. One of my favorite stories that has a bit of that message A woman describes a while back an old, tired-looking dog coming into her yard and she said she could tell from the collar, although there's no tags and the well-fed belly, that the dog was clean, the dog had a home, okay? And so he followed her into the house, he walked down the hall and he went to the couch, he just lay down on the couch and took a nap. And so she let him nap and then she writes this, she says, an hour later he went to the door and I let him out. The next day he was back, resumed his position on the couch and slept for an hour. This continued for several weeks. (laughs) Curious, I pinned a note to his collar that I wrote, every afternoon your dog comes to my house for a nap. I don't mind, but I want to make sure it's okay with you. The next day he arrived with a different note pinned to his collar. (laughs) He lives in a home with three children. He's trying to catch up on his sleep. May I come with him tomorrow? (laughs) So in a way I think of it like the only way we can start opening to this kind of mystery of awareness is this attitude that we're going to let our ego and our judging and our figuring out, let it just take a little nap, let it take a rest. Because you cannot figure out with your mind the nature of who you are. The mind is a part of what you are. It's like looking through your eyes and not being able to see your own eyes. You can't see as you look out. But you can be what you are as you relax back. Does that resonate a bit? Are you getting that a little? Okay. So let's look at what prevents, what what keeps us sustaining the trance, what keeps us fixated on the movie and in the narrative. It's a very basic existential predicament, which is we perceive separation and we get insecure and we feel like we have to be vigilant. What? Take a nap? There's problems to solve. There's things to do. There's things to protect. There's things to create. There's things. You know, we have this idea that we can't afford to take a nap or we can't afford for that 
ego that's so judgmental or striving or whatever to just rest a bit. And yet resting is what's needed. Okay? So that's what happens is we're in a uh, mind state of too dangerous, too much I need or want, cannot just notice what's in the moment and rest. Instead of noticing a moment and what's rest and resting, here's what happens. We come into this world and we start noticing that it's tough. So we develop this spacesuit kind of self that that helps us to navigate and get what we want and avoid what we don't want. It's as if we've created a mask for ourselves to get through. And we keep painting and adjusting and playing with and making the mask as better and better as we can. Sometimes called the persona. Okay, it's our ego presentation. So a lot of energy goes into our ego presentation. It's like resting means you're putting down the mask, right? But we're addicted to having that persona energized, that ego energized. So we keep on doing it. And the, cha- the problem is this. It's like in, in the Greek, uh, you know, in the Greek, w- the Greek word for persona meant sing through, okay? Which is the, like the actors had a mask and they would play through the mask, their parts. But the actors would, when they were done with the play, put their mask down. But we don't do that. We don't put down our spacesuit self. We don't put down the doing, fearing, worrying, defending self. We keep the mask on. And we think that's who we are. We move through the day identified with the mask and we forget who's looking through right now. Okay, so out of fear we get identified with this presentation, this ego self, and we forget who's listening or looking. The pain of it, that we then live out of the wants and needs that we're identified with, and we forget to listen to and attend to the deeper source of our being, the deeper longings. So a story for you. When he was very young, he waved his arms, gnashed the teeth of his massive jaws and tromped around the house so that the dishes trembled in the china cabinet. Oh, for goodness sake, his mother said, you're not a dinosaur, you're a human being. Since he was not a dinosaur, he thought for a while that he might be a pirate. Seriously, his father said at some point, what do you want to be, a fireman or a policeman or a soldier, some kind of hero? But in high school they gave him tests and told him he was very good with numbers. Perhaps he would like to be a math teacher. That was respectable. Or a tax accountant. He could make a lot of money doing that. It seemed a good idea to make money, what with falling in love and thinking about raising a family. So he was a tax accountant, even though he sometimes regretted that he was because it made him, well, small. He felt even smaller when he was no longer a tax accountant but a retired tax accountant. Still worse, a retired tax accountant who forgot things. He forgot to take the garbage to the curb, forgot to take his pill, forgot to turn his hearing aid back on. Every day it seemed he had forgotten more things, important things, like which of his children lived in San Francisco and which of his children were married or divorced. Then one day, when he was out for a walk by the lake, he forgot what his mother had told him. He forgot that he was not a dinosaur. He stood blinking his dinosaur eyes in the bright sunlight, feeling the familiar warmth on his dinosaur skin, watching dragonflies flitting among the horsetails at the water's edge. That was written by Bruce Holland Rogers. It's called Dinosaur. So, as many of us have have heard, uh, mentioned many times, that the regret of those that are dying, and this is, you know, a palliative caregiver describes this, really one of the major regrets was that I didn't live true to myself. I lived according to the expectations of others. You know, and it's not only the others, because we internalize it. So we live according to some ideas or standards, the shoulds, the ought tos that we've internalized, rather 
than true to our own hearts. This inquiry, who are you and what do you want, actually can save us if we go deep enough into it. Because most of us live at least a portion of our life in this trance where we are identified with that ego self that's operating according to the shoulds and the fears. And then as I mentioned, if we don't break out, that is the regret of the dying. I just did not live true to my heart. So if you want to begin to investigate, and I think it's critical, you know, where is my life energy getting kind of fixated and identified? What's the self-identity I get trapped in that stops me from really living from more of a sense of wholeness? We start looking and the way that the, the signs, the flags, are when we sense where we have the most fear our unmet needs. Do we have an unmet need to have attention? Do we have an unmet need to feel that we're approved of or respected or loved or valued? Do we have a fear we're going to fail on something or that we've already failed? Because those are the places around which we build the spacesuit and get most identified. So we start looking at it and we start sensing uh, that if the unmet need in some ways to feel safe that maybe we get identified with the persona of the addict because we know how attached and fixated we are on having certain substances to soothe us. Or if the unmet need is to feel safe maybe we need to be in control because if things are chaotic you know, we feel so at risk. So our personality gets organized in some controlling way. We have to be the boss in some way. There are many ways that we uh, kind of narrow ourselves. Sometimes this, the need is to be, you know, if we're not a really good person, then we'll get rejected. So we get identified as the meditator or the person on a spiritual path. That's an identity, right? We get attached to our roles. It's interesting to watch. So we each have a kind of I think of it a kind of resume or whatever of, of who we are and, uh, and that we kind of give out to the world. <coughs> I remember my husband Jonathan having a conversation with somebody who had, his, had just looked at his website and, um, he, and the guy asked him, this was about eight months ago, the guy asked him, well, I, I see you have um, Jonathan Faust and he had a few different initials and he says, CSA, what, what does that mean? And Jonathan's response was, Cub Scouts of America. (laughs) On his resume, you know. (laughs) He also had uh, (laughs) something something like um, certified termite inspector and then in parentheses expired. But I liked it because, you know, we, we have our resumes and they matter to us. And it might not be that we have a formal professional resume, but we have this thing of who I am and what I've done and, you know, and how attached are we to it? You know, how much do we need to be in that role? For many people, the role is being affiliated with a something. I am part of a this group or a this religion or a this whatever. And th- now the affiliations can, of course, be very positive, community feeling, but we also have a sense of getting our identity, our meaning from that. And I remember uh, watching a 60-minute interview of someone from the Mafia who described how he watched his, the people in his family and he knew that his destiny was either he was going to be in prison or die before he was like 40. He just knew it. And the question was, why would you stay? And it was, that's my family. That's who I am. So there's a sense of that's who I am. A little side story, an elderly man lived alone in New Jersey and he wanted to plant his annual tomato garden but it was very difficult work because the ground was hard. His only son, Vincent, who used to help him was in prison. The old man wrote a letter to his son and described his predicament. 
dear Vincent, I'm feeling pretty sad because it looks like I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year and it's given me so much pleasure. I'm just getting too old to be digging up a garden plot. I know if you were here my troubles would be over. I know you would be happy to dig the plot for me like in the old days. Love, Papa. A few days later he received a letter from his son. Dear Pop, don't dig up that garden. That's where the bodies are buried. Love, Vinny. <laughs> At 4 a.m. the next morning, the FBI agent and local police arrived and dug up the entire area without finding any bodies. <laughs> they apologized to the old man and then they left. <laughs> that same day, the old man received another letter from his son. Dear Pop, go ahead and plant the tomatoes now. That's the best I could do under the circumstances. <laughs> Love, Vinny. <laughs> I think I just wanted an excuse to read that. <laughs> so, but the point is that when we get identified in anything smaller than what we are, you know, I am a teacher, I am the boss, I am an addict, I am a whatever, it obscures the larger truth. It obscures the light and love and tenderness of our being. And what happens is we get disconnected from our capacity for real healing and disconnected from our natural intelligence and, and, not, and we get rigid, unable to change. That's where rigidity comes from. There's a, an older a story of a, a guy who was a smoker, a lifetime smoker, and he was hospitalized with emphysema. And after a series of small strokes, his daughter urged him, as she often had, to give up smoking. And he refused, he asked her to buy him some more cigarettes. And he told her, I'm a smoker this life, and that's how it is. Okay. But several days later, he had another small stroke, and apparently it was in one of the memory areas of the brain. And then uh, the next day, he, without a concern, he stopped smoking for good. And this wasn't because he decided to. He woke up and forgot he was a smoker. Okay, he forgot his identity. You know, in, to the extent that we're caught up in our roles and unable to put them down, we suffer. Okay? So, it happens to each of us. Uh, Rumi writes that whatever comes into being gets lost in being, drunkenly forgetting its way back. Okay? So we forget. And yet, the invitation of, I think, all of the wisdom traditions is that as much as we are conditioned to forget who we are, we have a capacity to remember and come home that that's the promise, that's the invitation. We have that capacity. We have the capacity to remember uh, really that spirit that lives through us. Um, now, there's a fear I want to mention that stops us sometimes from really looking into awareness and really relaxing back, taking that backward step, which is, well, if I do that and I really discover this vast, beautiful presence that's my nature, Will I still pay the bills, you know? Will I still remember how to function in a day-to-day way? And um, there's a great line which is, praise Allah and tie your camel to the post. <laughs> you know, that it's both end. We can remember our oceanness, spirit, that which is sacred, and, with a, and hold lightly these spacesuit cells. You know, um, you don't have to fight your ego, and we certainly can't get rid of the ego. It's kind of part of being incarnated that we use it to navigate, but we don't have to be identified with it. That's the, that's the teaching. And the pathway is to begin to pay deeper attention to where we're stuck. And I want to, the last part of maybe the last 15, 20 minutes, I want to describe two ways that we can deepen our attention that help us to really inhabit that wholeness. And one way is inquiry. 
If we ask questions, it directs our attention in a way that's very, very incisive and lucid and revealing. So one way to disidentify, to undo the tangle, to remember who we are, is this inquiry, like what is really true? And the second way is going to be, that we're going to explore is this letting be, where we really let be. Okay? And we're going to do this um, with very short reflections. And don't worry if I ask you to inquire and you don't come up with an answer. Because that's not the point. The point is just to get a taste of asking questions and then continue to explore on your own.